A lot of white Muslim reverts feel defensive or criticize when they hear the term white privilege. Even when it's white people saying it, even when it's white Muslim reverts saying it. Even though it is based on facts, research, statistics and lived experience. This video is about two things. First, understand that white privilege, very simply, is just like wealth. It can be used for good or bad. In an equal and fair society, it shouldn't exist. People shouldn't be treated differently for their skin color. But whether we want it or not in Western modern societies, this is something that exists. And if you're into Marvel, you may have heard the expression that with white privilege comes great responsibility. Let me know if I got this right. Your unique abilities make you a kind of Superman. Because of these great powers, you have a great responsibility. Am I crazy to say that? Why do people get upset? Because they feel attacked. But why? I don't know, I think you'd have to ask white Muslims why. <laughs> But it just, it's it just like basics, you know, just like you have wealth, you yeah, share it with people. Just like when you have knowledge, you teach people. I, I don't get it. I just think people see it as an attack and they start to think of like all the reasons why they're not privileged. Mm. And then that's what they do. I mean, but again, I'm not white. I suppose maybe you can answer that question better than I can. I wanted to make this video because I feel it's my duty to explain things as simply as possible and in a relatable way. Not only because it's my day job like at uni I'm, and I teach kids, students about these kind of things, but also reflecting on my own journey. I wanted to share my experiences of coming to terms with racism that started way before Islam in 2007. I'll talk about this. But I think, yeah, you've got a point. Lots of people feel hurt mm. somehow. There's lots of pain when people talk about white privilege. But I wanted to say to the viewers that if you tell me that, yes, I'm white, but I've been discriminated against. If you tell me that I'm white, but I'm not privileged because I'm working class or I'm white Muslim, but Muslims don't accept me. So I just wanted to say that, yes, I hear you. And because these are things I have experienced and I have tried to understand for the context. So I'm the son of Polish parents, migrants who came to France in the 80s. I'm a migrant myself, moved to the UK for looking for a better life. And I spent my early years in a council block in France. This is when actually I came to the UK that I realized my, about like my whiteness, that it was something posing problem for many Muslim and not only non-Muslims as well because of my parents' origins. And I will share my story to understand where it comes from. But in this video, so I'll be discussing a few things. Uh, first of all, we'll discuss about like whether or not it's uh, okay to or possible to keep one's culture when you're a like, white Muslim revert, when you embrace Islam. Also participating mm. in activist circles with people of color when it comes to anti-racism. And also very important, I think, especially in the British context, the difference between middle class or upper middle class, should I say, mm. white Muslim reverts and the rest. Because there's a clear difference that I think it's important to address. So. This video is about learning new perspectives. If you're in the mode where you, you're like, I would like to upgrade my system, my cognitive system, then yeah, I think this video is for, is for you because I'm still on this learning journey and I want to go further and further. But if you feel scared of exploring these topics or just hear my story, feel free to skip to another channel. And also don't subscribe because we don't make money out of this, this channel. I just use don't my subscribe. time, my energy and my money to run this channel because just like I consider that we are due zakat on our wealth, I'm due a form of sadaqa on my knowledge on what. Uh, and so this is a responsibility. I've got public funding uh, that I have been people have entrusted me this public funding for me to research and teach at uni. Um, about how these modern forms of uh, oppression impact us in a daily life and what can we do about it, what are the solutions and what are the good examples. So, yeah, because at the end of the day, what we want is a fair and just society. Do you want a fair and just society? I do. Do you want a fair and just society? Yeah, so that's we just, all just want a it. basic. <laughs> Racism is a system. It's not only overt insults or discrimi job discrimination. It's not something you can necessarily see, 
like beauty standards, mm -hmm. but this is something which has to do with culture, society, economics and politics, and we are all bathing in it, whether we want it or not. This is the state of things. Did I, did I got this right? Society knows, we all know that not all white people are racist, that not all men are violent, not all rich people are greedy. And the problem is that education, the media, popular culture, politics bombard us with ideas that harm people and willing or not, because we don't necessarily have the tools to have a critical di distance from them, uh, we get contaminated. And the key is to make the difference so we can use whatever power we have for good. So white privilege is a social reality. It's a fact uh, that non-Muslims are, white non-Muslims are more likely to listen to me just because of my skin color. Because, you know, it's subconscious. People think mm. they can relate more to someone like me who has the same skin color. And this is maybe why I often had more success, let's to say, in non-Muslim circles here in the UK than within like Muslim community. I find interesting in your perspective is that you were in a place where when you learned the damages done to uh, like th that whiteness as a system has mm. done through history so you were in a place where it was difficult for you to consider marrying a white people before so mm -hmm. how did that come and how did that change well it's what you pointed out i think it was not just the understanding the historical aspects of how whiteness has basically destroyed the world um, and oppressed people and literally changed the face of continents and extracted and the arrogance of whiteness which is so like disgusting um i'd also had terrible experiences with white people and i just thought to myself my culture is so different to yours this could never work and i don't think i would ever consider such a thing i it, it felt so oppositional that it would be like a weird thing to consider you know what changes i met you <laughs> And you were just really kind and you also weren't English, which helped. I don't know, I feel like if it had been like a really middle class, southern, like posh English guy, I don't think I could have really, um, really considered that. I think it was just, I think it's like, um, I don't know, maybe it's because of the relationship between like the UK and particularly the, the elite English and British India like I have this association where I'm like I can't mm. um I don't know maybe that's also like my sub well it's my kind of historical knowledge making me um feel a certain way about that but also um I have grown up in Englishness and Englishness has not been friendly to me it's always been hostile and at the helm and the forefront of that has always been English men and even all of the problems I've encountered at work that have been due to racism has have mainly been from English men. And actually rarely women, um, rarely queer people, rarely other marginalised groups. Okay, any Welsh or Scottish people? Never. Ah. <laughs> Interesting. It's but again, I haven't lived in Wales and I haven't lived in Scotland. Um, but I think what changed is that I met you and Actually, I didn't even I didn't even realize initially that you being Polish meant that there was anything different. Like I, I just found you to be lovely and kind, and you know I, f I found us to have like the same views in life, and we wanted the same things. Um, and I think that was enough. But I think subconsciously I was able to connect with you because you because I think if you had been English, that would have been harder. And if you, and also will me and you. I mean, it's weird. Our parents have really similar stories, but they're not from the same place. And we had quite a similar start to life. And I feel like because we were both on like the same class level, it didn't feel very difficult to relate to you, did it? I mean, I don't know if you felt the same, but... Although, you know, I maybe did not grow up in a like household of generational wealth where my parents, where my ancestors may have profited from slavery and, and mm. uh, colonial money. Still, I remember very vividly my parents, especially my mom, being very racist and Islamophobic. Mm. Especially, uh, it struck me when I embraced Islam, where she had all the stereotypical views you can imagine about Muslims. Mm. However, she was uh, making more the association with North Africans and people from, yeah, North mm. Africans, not even West Africans. Uh, but she had, like, she was, yeah, like, overtly, Dis disliking 
black people and, and Muslim and Islam as a religion in general. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in France where mm -hmm. kids are are taught that you know French people are the best, the the beacon of civilization. Like I have to consider myself as part of France, who invented the human rights and <coughs> like uh, w whatever like democracy. You cannot remove 18 years of education and growing up in such a family just like of by snapping you, your yeah. hands. So I did some of my views were posing you problems at the beginning? At times, you you had kind of a zeal and a kind of like energy for putting out your ideas. And I disagreed with the method of how you did it because I wanted you to consider that the community that you were talking to was minoritized, large, mostly people of colour and um, you need to be very gentle and careful that you can't just spout your ideas. It's quite tone deaf to do that. We disagreed about that because, you know, and I didn't just disagree about that with you either though. I had other friends who are artists who felt that provocation, satire were good means of creating discussion. My, I still hold the view that I don't feel provocation and satire are the best way to deal with a traumatized community. And I have friends who are black, Asian, Arab, who still think that that is a good way to do it. Now, I don't know if that's because of your whiteness or, whiteness or whether that's just a difference in opinion. I mean, what do you think so about I mean, that? When it comes to satire, it definitely comes from a, pay, uh, a place of mm. pain and frustration and that I wanted to turn into something we can laugh at. Uh, instead mm. of crying over the problems mm. we've witnessed in, 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 like mm. in our circles, in the community. I think you were right because we experimented regardless mm. and we saw the array of responses. Some people got it and some people uh, were hurt by, by it. Mm. And because the reason you just explained that, this is a community that has undergone trauma too much since yeah. since you no know, not only 9-11 in islamophobia but uh, like it's been ongoing mm. from generation and like research has proven it like intergenerational trauma is a thing mm. so whatever you know centuries of colonization and oppression it does something to people and which means that they are in a space where they first need to heal rather than uh, it's not easy for people to all be I would say self-critical and acknowledge what are like the things mm. that are going wrong because everyone is just so wounded mm -hmm. that you know the survival mode let's just say. And also I wanted to add with you being white one of the reasons I felt comfortable around you is because I didn't ever feel like your whiteness was um, I didn't ever feel like you're using it to your advantage intentionally and I could never have married someone who did that. That would have physically made me ill. Like I couldn't be around you if you were that kind of person. And I never felt as though you were optimizing or capitalizing on your whiteness. Um, and I didn't feel as though you, your, I didn't feel as though you would bring your whiteness in a room and make it loud and the center of attention. Um, and I felt your, your views on how to deal with your whiteness in a community as an academic were critical and satisfactory enough for me to trust you. And if I hadn't have felt that, I would never have even spoken to you. I wouldn't have entertained a conversation with you because for me, this is my personal space, this is my personal life, and I would never let someone in who had derogatory views about a, my community, who, um, who was arrogant, who was trying to use their whiteness to oppress others or dominate others. I mean, for me, this is abhorrent. Um, so I was actually incredibly direct with you, wasn't I? And I was very clear about what, you know, the questions I wanted to ask. And if you had answered them wrong, I would not I would have told you I wasn't interested. And even before meeting you, yeah. I have noticed and I have observed white Muslim reverts like unashamedly using their whiteness to mm. get ahead. We see you. We see you. And what you're, it's not okay. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, like on the serious side, I just felt that so disgusting, it is disgusting. that they would just brand themselves, use their whiteness to like brand, brand themselves, themselves. Yeah, yeah. and Sick. like almost occupy forcefully these positions of, yeah, ambassadors yeah. of British Islam or, or so on. More on this in a minute. So I have a question for you, Will. How did you realize you were privileged and how have you dealt with your whiteness as a consequence? The turning point of my life when I traveled to French Guiana to do my first photographic documentary. And so I was not Muslim at the time, 
but I wanted to make this documentary around Bushinenge people, who for the context are the descendants of African people who were enslaved by the French and the British and the Dutch and brought to South America to work on the plantations. And so they have fought for their freedom through 200, 300 years ago, and now they are, have established communities, villages on the main rivers of uh, French Guiana, Suriname, and uh, British Guiana as well. Uh, in French Guiana, it is a country which is still a French colony. So you've been to French Guiana. Mm. So you've seen it's everything. So weird. Everything looks just like <laughs> France. Post office, police station, so weird. bakeries, except for the Amazonian forest, of course. So, and this is because they have the European Space Center. British Guiana got its independence. Suriname got its independence. French Guiana is still a colony, st still a French district. I think it was my first time seeing and observing directly the effects of racism mm -hmm. and how people's views would, as a system, affect people and f kind of force them to live in very precarious conditions. In this part of France, people's mentality is like they have stopped like 300 years ago. On my first trip in 2008, I did interviews with white teachers and white doctors white doctors who refuse visits from black people, white teachers who told me that, you know, these black people are just thieves and robbers and if they live in poverty, it's just for people to take pity on them and use benefits and Stuff all the, the normal rhetoric. And this is when I realized that I had this positionality of power because the things these teachers and doctors were saying to me, they were saying to me, because they felt they could trust me just because of my skin color. So I realized I could navigate in these kind of spaces. And if I were hearing and seeing these facts, then I needed to do something about it. In French Guiana, I was someone in my 20s doing this photo documentary. I was not, you know, like this, like a rich guy, a famous guy, a powerful guy. I was just this like little student. And I think it's important to for people to realize that despite the conditions, the social and economic conditions people can find themselves in, the skin color allows mm. people to access certain spaces that they couldn't mm. otherwise. On my second trip to French Guiana, when I was doing interviews with white people, again, I had a direct job offer to work in a, in a, in a high school there. Uh, mm. just because they felt that I, w I was the, the, the right kind of guy. If I w had told them I was Muslim, I think it didn't have happened. If my mm. skin color was different, it wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. But my question is, uh, like, is it uh, enough to realize that you have privilege? Because I also realized in my journey that you can read as much as you want. You can read Fanon, Said, wh wh like wherever, as, as many books as you want. You can. You need at some point to experience marginality to understand what it means to be uh, at the margins. I embraced Islam in 2008. Uh, it was in France and at the time, me being Muslim in France, apart from my parents, I didn't have any problems during my studies uh, and working amongst Muslims or uh, getting married, getting, like having friends. I really felt in France that with Muslims I had it was like that. I had a family outside of my blood family. I was part of the community and we were just this kind of like big family mm. at, at the time. Things have changed, I've, I've been told. But I've never lived with this really consciousness that I was white and it made something different until I came to the UK. I think the very first time I realized is uh, when, you know, applying for jobs or trying to get married, I've been told that well, you're not the right kind of white Muslim because of my parents' origin, because they're Polish. I don't know if everyone has to go through like trauma. Hmm. I don't know. I think Allah can make people realize things in the way that is going to make sense to them. I, I know it's a very cheesy question, and, but, and you may have heard this a lot, but do you have a piece of advice, a general piece of advice hmm. for pe people to understand racism? I like the way Bell Hooks talks about racism or any system and she calls it domination. I think it's the easiest way. 
And I, I actually feel like that word helps you to understand exactly what racism is and does. It dominates people, it makes them feel small, it oppresses them, and you feel stuck under it and you feel maligned by it and you feel marginalised by it. And domination is the best way to understand it. And if you're, look, if you're white or, and you're being a dominator and you know that you're acting out that part of yourself, that's something you have to be critical of in, in, a, in a different way, but kind of the same theme. If I am in an all black space and I am being dominating and I'm exhibiting dominator culture, as Bell Hooks talks about, then I need to step back and think and stop. Yeah, I think Bell Hooks model, by the way, link in the description, Bell, Bell Hooks, uh, is I think her idea of dominator model is explains so much in the society, mm -hmm. which is not limited to racism. It's also va very valid for wealth inequalities, mm -hmm. gender inequalities, all forms of oppression, because mm -hmm. this is how the society is geared. And mm -hmm. whether we know, she talks about, you cannot dissociate racism mm -hmm. from patriarchy, uh, neoliberalism, um, capitalism, and other forms of oppression. They all work together because they are part of this dominant model. We are taught from day one at school to dominate, to compete with each mm -hmm. other, to crush each other. Mm -hmm. So she also emphasized really on the dimension of healing, me coming to the UK and being treated differently because of my parents, something I cannot change. It had consequences, meaning that I couldn't afford accommodation, I couldn't have a salary to sustain myself, to get food mm -hmm. on the table. When I felt that I started to feel very inferior, feeling mm -hmm. not worthy of love, not worthy, not being good enough as a human being, as, as a Muslim, I think I started to really empathize with whoever would tell me, tell me similar experiences of rejection and uh, be the like be it for like disability for the skin color for uh, their appearance mm. uh, because these are things i haven't been through but i could relate and i would also add like you have a kind of you have quite like a gentle masculinity and you have quite like a, a lovely way of being male <laughs> Of yeah, but that's because I've been broken. Uh, I, I know this, but what I'm saying is that a lot of the rejections and things you would have experienced and also the treatment also may have been because people don't consider you to fall into a uh, traditional kind of hyper-masculinity. And I'm sure you experienced some of these things because of that as well, like being disgustingly overconfident or like, you know, Ex you you don't you don't really exhibit those things in your personality, but that's yeah. I think it's an active choice because you know just like in the like Stranger Things like people you know they crush the bones and stuff. This is what life has done to me, mm. and I'm I think I don't want anyone to experience same. the same things. Yeah, same here, yeah. So this this is why I make this active choice of being kind and supportive with boundaries though, not to anyone anymore, but uh, yeah, tr just to try to serve people. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not here for myself because I'm gonna die someday. Mm -hmm. What can I do for the others to make their life better on earth so they don't experience what I, I've experienced? One thing I would say to fellow white Muslim reverts is, for example, think of a time you suffered because of someone you trusted, then this person said some things to you or did something to you, or judged you in a certain manner, or a time where you were denied opportunities that you deserved because of your skills, your your qualifications, your experience, uh, but you were denied for X, Y, as a reason because uh, of things you couldn't change. Yeah, maybe just you know on the journey to Islam, how did your family or your friends treated you differently because of this choice you made of embracing Islam? Or if you are in an intercultural marriage and you have children who are not white, like see how do people treat them differently? And uh, it does something to people to see their kids being treated differently. Yeah, I think it's important to add though, like, okay, we can empathize and we can use our own experiences to try to understand other people's experiences and hold their experiences. I can do that for someone who's disabled, right? But I don't know what it's like to be disabled. And I think that's an important distinction, right? So you will, as a white person, you can empathize, listen, hold space. You won't ever though know what it's like to go through racism, right? And you won't 
understand that to its entirety. And I feel like that's okay. That doesn't matter. You don't necessarily need people to like go through it to entirely understand your experience, and for that, you know, for that to be the thing that you connect on. But I think it. I think people need to also understand that just because you empathize and you you have thought about something, like it's important not to approach people and be like, yeah, no, I totally get you. And it's like, well, you don't. But I think I'm all right with that. That doesn't bother me. I don't need you to go through what I go through. I just need you to be empathetic, kind, holding, accepting, and defend me where I need to be defended. Like that's what I need from people. And that's what solidarity is, isn't it? But I think it's patronising if I said to a disabled person, "I know exactly what you're going through." No, no, I don't. I, I'm not physically disabled. I don't know what that's like. And I think that's like a really important point. What do you think of this? Of course, because, well, you know, these experiences happened. I would say it was punctual. It was, mm. it was not constant. These yeah. are things I've experienced reasonably often, but. For someone who is black, let's say, someone who is a woman, it's just, you cannot compare because no. they, these experiences of rejection, they it's, are constant on a daily basis and I cannot even imagine like how does it feel to exactly. be, to f like, take hits constantly yeah. on a daily basis. And even, well, I can't even imagine that because I'm not black and I don't wear a hijab. Like, and, and I know it's, it's all different, right? Like you can go outside and blend and I can't. But I also, no one knows I'm Muslim and I'm also not black and I'm also, I don't have a physical disability. Like there's so many things where I'm like, okay, Jab, but what you can do is be there for people, hold space for people. And when it's the time to make things better for people, not in a savior kind of way, but in like a responsible way. And where it's time to defend and protect people, that's where we show up. When it's time to defend people and protect people, I think that's a part we, li we miss, Will. People should have been there to take care, to protect and defend us, if they could. Yeah. You know, if I see something going on at work, and someone is being treating a disabled person in a wheelchair awfully, I have to speak up. And if I don't, I I think that's a problem. So it's like important that people understand that it's not just about listening and empathy, but it's about action as well. In your perspective, how privilege is talked about in Islam? Reminds me of a verse in the Quran which, it, which says, The believing men and believing women are allies of one another. They enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong and establish prayer and give zakat and obey Allah and his messenger. Those, Allah will have mercy upon them. Indeed, Allah is exalted in might and wise. So the way I understand this is that the Quran is not telling men to oppress women. <laughs> the Quran is saying that we're allies of one another and other translations say that we're friends of one another there's another translation which says that we're supporters of one another allies of protectors of one another so there's different ways of translating that and for me this it's just really clear for me in the deen that the the whole notion that not one party is not supposed to oppress or be above the other one but they were here to be there for each other and when i when i think about male privilege or white privilege and then we think about the last sermon that the prophet gave where he talked about an arab being not superior to another arab or this person not being superior to that person but the only way we can judge someone is by their character and their deeds right that there's clear injunctions here about how really ultimately what we're here to do is take care of each other and the things that we will actually be judged for by Allah is the way that we behave and the way that we act and our deeds. And I feel like that's just a very clear way of understanding privilege in the deen, right? That you're not here to use your privilege to dominate other people. That you're here to be a steward and you're here to take care and you're here to do good things because ultimately that's what will be with you. So whether that's your maleness or your whiteness or whatever it is, I think it's very clear what you're supposed to do with yourself, right? And I don't, I don't think it can be any clearer. I actually don't think it's a complicated thing. I start from the concept of zakat. Uh, why zakat was made compulsory on people is because of this very simple concept that if you have wealth and you've got a society where people don't have any any, any wealth, there is a duty from those who have to share with those who have not. 
and this is why there, there is zakat. And there is also a very important hadith about people, people of knowledge, scholars, that are promised to hell if they don't share their knowledge. You see, I, I see in Islam this the dimension of responsibility that you mentioned through khilafah, through stewardship, that we are here to protect and support each other. And one of the ways we can do that is through our resources and our privileges in whatever shape or form, whether it is money, whether it is knowledge, whether it is visibility, whether it is ability, the ability to do something with our hands, whether it is with any kind of skills. And in this unequal society, when white privilege is one of these kind of resources we unjustly benefit from, then there is also this choice we have to make. What are you using this for? And you know, you, you might get the question from a white Muslim who's really poor and be like, I don't have anything to give anyone else. Right? And I can imagine that that is a legitimate question people would ask. But I would say giving is not just like money, right? It could be like, right, you only have enough money and you've got three kids and a wife and you're white and your wife is South Asian or black. I can't go out there and do anything with my whiteness. That's what people might think. Yeah, but you're taking care of your family. And what you can do is invite people into your home and listen to them and give them space and time. And if someone in your family says something racist, challenge it. And if you're, I don't know, you get a new job and you start to earn a bit more, make sure that you're defending marginal people, marginalised people. And I feel like, you know, we also have to start thinking small and think about how can we affect the things around us and not think like, well, I'm a poor white Muslim, I can't do anything. Well, you can do small things. Everyone can do small things. This society makes us believe that we don't have any power. And mm. this is why you, want peop you see people who want to get richer, more powerful, even though they are already extremely rich or powerful. We've met numerous white Muslim reverts who always complain that no matter how hard they work, uh, they don't get like anywhere in the Muslim community, they don't get support, um, they, especially those who are, uh, have a history of prison, for example, a mm. history of mental illness, a criminal record. We need also to compare this situation with other white Muslim rivers born in the south of England very specifically who've been to, let's say, Oxford, Cambridge, mm. private schools, Eton, um, who have generational wealth, whose parents like vote conservative. And we see Muslims fighting over them, mm. for them to and put them in um, positions of high visibility because they consider them as cultural bridges between Islam and British Muslims and the, the, the mainstream British society, or like ambassadors for Islam. So many people, for example, were on the far right and embrace Islam, all of a sudden become super big celebrities, influencers, mm -hmm. white influencers who embrace Islam, the same things. But will class matters and also arrogance and beauty seems to get you places. <laughs> and I know this is ugly, but it's like facts. If you're like this, if you're like middle class, conventionally beautiful and have this extroverted, arrogant personality, you'll pretty much, unfortunately, get anywhere. And white. And I just feel like if you're, if, if for instance, you're white, but you don't have the rest of those things, you're less likely to. I have a question because we, so we've seen lots of these like ultra privileged uh, white Muslim converts taking positions that should have been given to people who have the actual skills, the qualification and the experience, but who is guilty in that process? Is it them being guilty of accepting these positions of power, these positions of ambassadors of Islam, or is it the wider Muslim community for putting them in a position they don't deserve? Maybe people are accepting things uncritically and other people are putting people in positions uncritically. I don't think you can say one person is at fault there, what do you think? No, I agree. I yeah. think it's, I definitely believe it's a very complex it's matter. It's a complicated situation. Yeah. People, they can, on the on one end, people can make a choice of selecting people who have actually, you know, skills, qualification, mm. experience. And on the other end, if you're put in that position, when I've been asked, for example, to participate to like panels, events or, or podcasts and always try to, you know, 
first before saying yes I just think is there anyone who is more suited than me I can recommend and in, in because we've got friends mm. who don't who's who've done like amazing things and they are not given the visibility the platform or even like the money that they, they need and they deserve it's true, it's true. I think it's factual I think so people can say no it's a uh, they can uh, say no but then also why are people asking the same people <laughs> like why are they asking the same middle-class English white people but maybe those with more power should be the ones who are more critical I don't know if the, the guilt is equal but there's certainly complicity from the community and I also feel like people understand that it's pragmatic I know that's messed up right but it's actually true I'm not saying it's right it's just like factual like some of our working class white friends who did a degree at the Open University aged 40 versus Abdurrahim Murad. Now, I'm not saying it's right, but who is going to get more funds coming into the community in the UK? Well, you tell me. Yeah. And we've seen like people having been doing work for like decades, literally, but because they're of a certain social economic background. Yeah. People don't give then, like a... And I know that we could point fingers and say it's the problem of the white Muslims who take up the positions, it's the problem of the community. But Will, unfortunately, this is how the structures are working and people are unfortunately being like, we need to be pragmatic here. Who are we going to put in this position that's going to get us... It's very utilita utilitarian. I know it's messed up, but I also, I also think to myself... I don't want to be a part of that process because I don't think I could make that ethical decision. And why it doesn't happen uh, to that extent in France where you will never see white Muslim reverts being... I'm sure. Like, be, like being treated as demigods, really. Um, I don't know why it's like that here. I think it's a really good question. I really feel like class plays into it a lot here. And I don't know if it does in the same way in, in France. You know, this is a very classist, hierarchical society. I mean, we literally have lords and baronesses and OBEs and MBEs. It's a weird place we live in. I mean, the French Revolution sorted some, some of these things out, didn't it? Unfortunately, like, well, fortunately, in terms of getting rid of this hierarchy. And I think that does make a difference in some way. I just feel like it comes back to, like, the thing we talked about before, which is that I just feel like the French community have to stick together in a different way that we do here. Maybe it's just not as hierarchical. But is it because we've brought into the integration narrative here more than the French Muslims? Because the French Muslims know they can never integrate because they're always going to be seen as separate. It's the illusion of the, the fact that you could become a part of the British whatever. I think you're right. Aspiration plays a huge role mm. because... We've seen examples of uh, people because of they're part of a certain social class or uh, mm -hmm. they have a certain education. They their Islam doesn't really impede on their capacity at being successful in the modern framework. Well, in France, even if you let's say the pre the president or the prime minister or uh, you're some kind of super great like celebrity and you embrace Islam, you're going to automatically be relegated to the margins. No matter yeah. your status, your wealth, your fame, if you embrace Islam you're in out. France, you're out. Okay, so and we've here. seen this because there's this like, really mm. good rapper, she embraced Islam, she was super famous, but from the moment she embraced Islam, it's like the mainstream, the, the, the media completely disowned her. But here, that wouldn't happen. So the illusion that you can reach great heights still exists here. And the fact that you can integrate into the... Well, we have lords in the House of Lords who are Muslim. I mean, you're talking about integration into the aristocratic structure. Not only just media and mainstream. Like Here, there's that, there's that idea that you can become part of the British system. Can white people be discriminated against? Can white people be discriminated against? If we, if we define discrimination as people being marginalised, then yeah, of course they can. Being racist to white people is not a thing. Because remember, racism is a system. It's not insults yeah. and just discrimination. It's yeah. a system. So they, they, they cannot be racism against white people because they are the dominating mm category yeah. in the UK, in the Western white yeah. world, 
but they can be discriminated prejudiced against. Yeah, that, that's possible. I suppose it depends. I mean, yeah, if that's the definition. Then yeah, it is possible. Some white Muslim reverts, for example, take issue with khutbas in mosques being in Urdu, for example, mm. or in Somali, or or on any language apart from English. They take issue. They take issue that some mosques are predominantly Pakistani, Somali, mm. Turkish, whatever. What's the what, what's their problem? I have a simple response. People need to just get over it. <laughs> I don't know, really know what to say about that. But I want you to say something first. So I think a lot of people don't understand the history of the presence of Muslims in the UK, where, you know, it's, uh, well, back to basics, but sometimes we need to go back to basics. People left their country, left their families mm -hmm. very often to come to this country uh, because of the like colonization, the, 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 the history, and uh, because w they, f they fled from war in their mm. home countries. And so they arrived in a country where they weren't familiar with the language or how society works, and they were in survival mode. And the first place they would go to find support, to masjid. find relief, yeah. is the masjid, is the mosque. If you're white, in, well, these Engli white English people, they g go to s countries like Spain or the Philippines and they make these own communities of expats. Mm, it's the same thing. Well, they're just immigrants. Um, <laughs> they, it, it's, it's the same. You are seeking people who speak the same language, yeah. who ha share the same cultural references and who share a similar experience of displacement and from whom you can seek advice support, guidance. Mm. It is very important to remember that, yeah, why some mosques, uh, people are mainly, let's say, Pakistani and they speak Urdu, it is because it, t it was a social hub. Yeah. It was a, a hub for, it was like a second home for people, yeah. for, for them to, to come feel to safe, socialize, yeah. feel safe and um, find some respite from all the oppression in the society. Uh, yeah. ha have some time outside of, uh, uh, you know, like the survival where we have a time to connect with God, with uh, yeah. other people, rather than, you know, it's otherwise you just go to work, go back home, you eat, and, and that's it. The mosque was uh, like a oxygen bottle for people. And I would add, Will, that if you're a white Muslim and you have an issue with people speaking their community's language in a mosque, I would say maybe just get over it and go and listen to some khutbahs in English or find a mosque where they speak English. I really, I think it's a, a non-issue. I just think it's like, you have to remember that not everything centers around white people and whiteness in English. Oh and my God. why don't they learn how to speak Urdu? Go, there you go. You live in East London, you're white. Time to learn Bangla. I think it's about time that you integrated into your community. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Anyway, but just get over it. I really think, you know what, Will? I just think there's some things where I'm like, stop centering yourself and get over yourself. You know, the white ego needs to be dismantled. Yeah. Get over it. Or exercise. Mm. What if you learn, let's say, Bangla, Urdu, Somali, Turkish, whatever, and once you practice a little bit, try to speak uh, l yeah. the language of the people and see how do they react? Yeah, yeah. maybe they'll be happy. There's also, again, a, a trauma response. Some people who fear that when they see uh, a white Muslim revert that they might be informants for the police because the police, yeah. the FBI in the US, they have used informants. Yeah, it has yeah, happened, yeah. this is a real thing. But again, the, and it has traumatized people. Uh, stop and search, house being raided, and just arrests. Uh, and yeah, just this is you know something people need also mm -hmm. to understand that we, are if we embrace Islam, we are entering uh, in a realm, in a society that has been collectively traumatized, mm. not only for years since 9-11, but again, and marginalized, decades, yeah. yeah, and everything, yeah. And I feel like it's just an important thing to realize that your whiteness may, be, may your, your centering of your whiteness may be a part of your, e your ego, your ego that you have to break down and really just be humble about the fact that it's okay for you to feel awkward sometimes it doesn't matter it's fine and people should try and include you i agree with that you're only a muslim but you should also try and make an effort with them i think this is the crux of the matter because 
the first part of what you say, I think people can get really offended when you say to someone, decenter yourself, which is true. This is something we have to do as Muslims. Uh, we decenter ourselves we because do. the world doesn't revolve not only like us, humanity, it revolves around God, around Allah. And, and this is something which I I is very difficult to do, even when we talk from a, a, like a social level, how uh, can you get comfortable, let's say, go camping when all you've done all mm. your life is living in a, the, all the comfort you can imagine yeah. in the UK. It's a, it's, it's a very hard step, but I, we need to remember that as Muslims, as human beings, regardless of faith, we are all travelers in our world that we borrow from the Creator. And which means that when just like, you know, we travel, it's not going to be a journey with like five star hotels all the way uh, where people will adapt for us and give us the best service. Because we are by definition, because being human, we are Khilafah, we are those who are supposed to serve others. So whenever we travel to a place, whenever we go to a place, we need to ask ourselves, how can we be of service to people? Of course, it's not easy and because the journey of embracing Islam for many people is traumatic. It causes pain. It's uh, mm. very difficult to deal with you know, family, uh, friends, how they, people change attitudes even in the workplace. People experience problems or they get in a marriage and it's very, very difficult and people don't have necessarily the tools and the space and the time to think about this. But this is, I think, the, the guiding thing of being Muslim, being Khilafah, mm, even a joke. People don't necessarily know how to identify racism, make the difference when it's just a joke or I if the person is actually being racist because this is there is a very thin line but it just takes very little time to analyze the power dynamics mm. that even if the joke is actually innocent for the people receiving the joke it, be painful, yeah. it can be very very painful because this joke is has a history why people why people are allow themselves to make fun of these kind of things. Even if the pe person has good intention, this joke has a context, has a history. And mm. is when it's directed against someone who has been victim of oppression, mm. or has some, someone who belongs to the margin, someone who's vulnerable, then it's just not okay. Mm. And I think it's a, it's a lifetime learning curve, but people need to be aware of this thing. And the key mm. is to make the difference. Analyze what are the power dynamics and just be careful, like racism can also happen when we think it's completely innocent because there's this mm -hmm. unbalance in the first place. When it comes to having kids, we are discussing which culture are we going to transmit our kids. And I am, I would be more than happy to transmit the Polish part of my culture, but m much less about the French part of uh, my culture. I think this idea that white Muslims don't have culture and they're like these pure like people who enter our religion because they don't have our cultural baggage is just nonsense. Everyone has cultural baggage. But we can also make an active choice about which parts of the culture, we, the culture we're from we want to leave behind and which parts we want to take forward. So my view is that we should teach our kids French and Urdu. And what about Polish? And they'll learn Polish from at some point, right? I argue that <laughs> let's teach them Polish and they will learn French at school. Right. So I think me and Will have a different view on this, right? And also, what about Punjabi? My poor, my, my love Punjabi. Like, I don't know when they're going to learn that. But anyway, these are, these are decisions me and Will will have to make. But yeah, like we all have cultural baggage. We all carry our culture with us. But we can also make a choice to what degree, which cultural norms, customs, ideas we can take forward or not. I do think we have the agency to do that. For example, you may have an opinion about what is cultural appropriation and what do is not. Do you have one? I have a theory. Can you say it first? Because mm. I feel that there's a difference between wearing shalwar kameez to blend or because you appreciate it, mm -hmm. uh, like in, in Pakistan, or when you were invited um, at a wedding or uh, if you wear it at your in-laws and wearing it for likes on social media yeah. or for pushing your brand or 
if you want to take advantage of the culture for your own gain, basically, or your own entertainment. For example, we, we know about this trend of white influencers who embrace Islam just for you know, traveling safely to Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Egypt, and, and so on. Uh, and just like ditch when Islam when they just go back, back, back home. Um, yeah. These are, I think, selfish endeavors. Uh, and that's, that's not okay. Maybe it's just about respect, like just do it in a respectful way. I think, I think we can always tell when things are not respectful. We also need to acknowledge that we won't be having this very discussion without the sacrifice of countless Muslims mm. and non-Muslims, people at the margins, who have been imprisoned, killed for being who they are because they were of the wrong religion of the, or the wrong skin color or the wrong gender. And it's because all of these people who have died, who are like martyrs that we, people like us, can find the words of these the ideas and the concepts to explain these injustices, be aware of it, and try to work on ourselves to be better people. Like Islam, you know, you have the, the, the sanad, the chain of transmission. So this discussion, even like our marriage, wouldn't have been possible if we didn't have the tools. And I think it's very important to recognize it. So again, I think another element is recognition. Whenever we find an idea beautiful, is to always credit the person who has... Say their name. Yeah, say, say, say the name of the people. It's, it, it's, it's difficult because we're navigating not rough seas, but a very complex terrain mm. if we want to make a hiking analogy. And it's, it can feel very tricky to know where to put your foot and how to, to move forward. <laughs> um, but it's, I would say, you know, life is very similar to hiking. It's about understanding uh, the landscape, mm -hmm. understanding the map. And once we've got the, the, the tool and, and the compass of uh, Islam, which is a wonderful one, it's a compass, you know, of mercy and stewardship. It's very, very simple. Just, uh, yeah. Keep in mind that even if the society makes us feel like that, we're not powerless. We also have agency. We have the power to change things, change ourselves. Thanks for watching. Again, don't subscribe. Don't this is subscribe. not a channel about whiteness uh, or about privilege or what, <laughs> whatever. Take care of each other and till next time. Oh, okay. Hey, are you, are you okay? I got a lot going on in my dimension, like a lot. With great power comes don't great... Don't you dare finish that sentence. Don't do it. I'm sick of it.